take thee light and burn thee bright and the spell be cast the right. The spell of witchcraft With Patricia Crowder This week, witch hunt witchcraft, which is a thing grown very common amongst us, I know it to be a most abominable sin, and I have been occupied these three quarters of this year in the sifting out of them that are guilty. We are taught by the laws both of God and men that this sin is most odious and punishable by death. King James I. He holds a lot of responsibility for the witch hunts that mounted up in this country during the 17th century. Henry VIII first introduced a statute against witchcraft, but in 1604, King James' act against conjuration, witchcraft, and dealing with evil and wicked spirits paved the way for the witch hunters. If any person or person shall use, practice, or exercise any invocation or conjuration of any evil or wicked spirit, or take any dead man or child out of his or her grave, or shall use, practice, or exercise any witchcraft, enchantment, or sorcery whereby any person shall be killed, destroyed, wasted, consumed, pined, or lamed in his or her body, or any part thereof. Such offender or offenders shall suffer pains of death as a felon or felons. Ironically, King James became skeptical about some of the witch trials. And in the last nine years of his reign, only five people were executed for witchcraft. The witch hunts had the Bible to back them up, or so it appeared, and especially a line in Exodus, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Though it was pointed out as early as 1584 that this was a mistranslation, the Hebrew word kaska, which occurs 12 times in the Old Testament, actually means poisoner, and has nothing to do with the 17th century conception of a witch. The witch scare, which had started in Europe under the influence of Calvin, came to Britain with a vengeance. Absurd confessions were put into the people's mouths, and they went to their deaths. The land is full of witches. They abound in all places. I have hanged five or six and twenty of them. Few of them would confess it. Some of them did. She confessed that the devil did appear to her in the shape of a little dog and bid her to forsake God and lean to him. She called her devil by the name of Bunny. Their malice is great, their practice devilish, and if we do not convict them, they will in a short time overrun the whole land. She further said that her retainer Bunny carried Thomas Gardler out of a window who fell into a cesspool. My opinion is that when witchfinders had kept the poor people without meat or sleep till they knew not well what they said, then to ease themselves of their tortures, they told them tales of their dogs and cats and kittens. She further says that Jane Holt, Elizabeth Harris, Joan Argo were her fellows. She further says that her devil told her that Elizabeth Harris cursed the boat of one John Wolfcott, and so it came to pass. The devil is a spirit of darkness. He deals closely and cunningly. You shall hardly find direct proofs in any such case. But by many presumptions and circumstances you may gather it. No doubt he can take any form upon him for his advantage to deceive. Though some write that he cannot take the form of a dove or a lamb. She likewise says that the devil sucked her twice since she came into the prison. He came to her in the form of a mouse. <coughs> This present government alleged to the devil sent fully empowered to treat about finding revolted witches out. 
1613, Janet Device, daughter of Elizabeth Device of the Forest of Pendle aforesaid, widow, confesseth, and saith that her said mother is a witch, and this she knoweth to be true. For she hath seen her spirit sundry times come unto her said mother in her own house called Marking Tower, in the likeness of a brown dog which she called Ball. And at one time, the said Ball did ask this examinate's mother what she would have him do. And this examinate's mother answered that she would have the said Ball to kill John Robinson of Barley, alias Swire. By help of which said Ball, the said Swire was killed by witchcraft accordingly. Whatever punishment one can order against witches by roasting and cooking them over a slow fire is not really very much, and not as bad as the torment which Satan has made for them in this world, to say nothing of the eternal agonies which are prepared for them in hell. For the fires here cannot last for more than an hour or so, until the witches have died. So said a French lawyer in 1580. Witches were subjected to gruesome tortures on the continent. In this country, their treatment, it would appear, was more humane. In England, they were hanged. In Scotland, they were burned. If they were uncooperative, green wood was used. The fire was slower that way, and so was the death. The treatment of witches in Scotland led to this outburst in 1608 by the Earl of Mar. Albeit they persevered, constant in the denial of guilt to the end, yet they were burned alive after such a cruel manner that some of them died in despair, renouncing and blaspheming, and others, half burned, broke out of the fire, and were cast in alive in it again, until they were burned to death. Torture was not allowed in England, but Matthew Hopkins, who called himself the Witchfinder General, discovered a way round this. He found it in Demonology, the book written by James I, which was regarded as the guide to witch hunters. There are two other good helps that may be used in their trial. The one is the finding of their mark, and the trying of the insensibleness thereof. The other is their floating on the water, for it appears that God hath appointed for a supernatural sign of the monstrous impiety of witches, that the water shall refuse to receive them in her bosom, that have shaken off the sacred water of baptism. This gave Hopkins an excuse to carry out the tests of pricking and swimming. The first involved thrusting pins deep into the body. If he found a place where the victim couldn't feel the pin, that was a proof of witchcraft. For swimming, the victim's hands and feet were tied behind her, her right big toe to her left thumb, and vice versa. She was then thrown into the local pond or mill stream. If she floated, she was a witch. If she sank, she was innocent. In either case, she lost her life, as victims who sank usually drowned before they could be saved. Matthew Hopkins was the son of a Puritan minister and was brought up as a strict Calvinist. He flourished during the Civil War, towing the country, seeking out witches. For each witch he discovered, the local town paid him 20 shillings, good money then. His first victim was an old woman with one leg. Her name was Elizabeth Clark, and she was a neighbour of Hopkins at Manningtree in Essex. She and five others were hanged. To find them witches, Hopkins referred to another part of James I's demonology. This said that witchcraft meant keeping imps and familiars, which women suckled with special teats concealed on their bodies. The said Elizabeth Clark forthwith told this informant and one master stern that if they would say and do the said Elizabeth no hurt, she would call one of her white imps and play with it in her lap. The old woman died as a result of an extraordinary deposition made by Hopkins. He claimed that she was visited by familiar spirits while he watched her in prison. They came, he said, in curious guises. Holt, who came in like a white kitten. Jeremiah, who came in like a fat spaniel without any legs at all. Vinegar Tom, who was like a long-legged greyhound with a head like an ox. Sack and Sugar, like a black rabbit. News, like a polecat. All these vanished away in a short time. Encouraged by the success of his first efforts at witch-seeking, Hopkins toured through Essex, Norfolk and Suffolk, accompanied by his helper John Stern and then on to Cambridge, Northampton, Huntington, and Bedford. One of his victims was the Reverend John Lowes, vicar of Branston. To extract a confession, he was kept awake for many nights by relays of runners. 
They ran him backwards and forwards about the room until he was out of breath. And then they rested him a little and ran him again. And they did this until he was weary of life and scarce sensible of what he did or said. The old man was also thrown into a castle ditch and found to float. He finally confessed that he'd covenanted with the devil, suckled familiars, and had bewitched cattle. He'd also caused a ship to sink off Harwich. On his way to the gallows, he renounced his confession and maintained his innocence. As a priest wouldn't read the burial service, he did it himself. Incidentally, no check was made to see if a ship really did sink off Harwich. Hopkins sent hundreds of people to their deaths. After pricking her body, he often got a girl to confess by threatening to thrust the long pin in her breasts. And has he not, within a year, hanged three score of them in one shire, some only for not being drowned, and some for sitting above ground whole nights and days upon their breeches, and feeling pain were hanged for witches? Hopkins went too far, and people began to ask questions about his way of finding witches out. The Reverend John Gall, vicar of Great Stoughton, attacked Hopkins' methods. Every old woman with a wrinkled face, a furrowed brow, a hairy lip, a gobber tooth, a squint eye, a squeaking voice or a scolding tongue, having a rugged coat upon her back, a skull cap on her head, a spindle in her hand and a dog or cat by her side is not only suspected but pronounced a witch. Every new disease, notable accident, miracle of nature, rarity of art is by them accounted for no other but an act and effort of witchcraft. And for this, the witch must be suspected and this suspicion is enough to send for which searches. Hopkins was also attacked by a parliamentary news magazine, the Moderate Intelligencer. Many are condemned, and some are executed, and more like to be. Life is precious, and there is need of great inquisition before it is taken away. John Gall published Select Cases of Conscience, exposing Hopkins' methods of torture. Hopkins countered with a pamphlet called Discovery of Witches, but he'd lost his backing. Judges queried his torture methods, and they questioned his fees. It was rumoured that as he was able to discover so many witches, he must have had access to the devil's role of disciples, and only a witch could have this. Horror films like to depict a gruesome end to the self-styled witch-finder general, but the facts are less spectacular. Hopkins returned to his home in Manningtree, Essex, and within a year he died of TB. The Sheffield area seems to have been relatively free of witch hunts, but in the north of England, witch hunting received a stimulant from north of the border, and skill prickers were often hired from Scotland. Here's an account of one of the Scottish witch hunters. There came to Inverness one Mr. Patterson, who had run over the kingdom for trial of witches, and was ordinarily called the pricker, because his way of trial was with a long brass pin. Stripping them naked, he alleged that the spell spot was seen and discovered. After rubbing over the whole body with his palms, he slipped in the pin, and it seems, with shame and fear being dashed, they felt it not. But he left it in the flesh, deep to the head, and desired them to find and take it out. It is sure some witches were discovered, but many honest men and women were blotted and broke by this trick. This villain gained a great deal of money, having two servants. At last, he was discovered to be a woman, disguised in man's clothes. A lot of innocent people went to their deaths because of lies told by children under oath. It started with the trial of the war boy witches in 1593, when five hysterical girls sent an old couple and their daughter to the gallows. Four years later, William Summers, known as the boy of Nottingham, accused 13 women of bewitching him. He was, however, exposed and confessed he'd learnt how to act as though bewitched from a chapbook on the war boy witches. In Leicester in 1616, Nine people were hanged before 13-year-old John Smith was found to be an imposter who'd faked being bewitched. The classic case of children as accusers occurs at Salem in Massachusetts. Twenty-two people were executed for witchcraft due to the pranks of several hysterical girls who became known as the witch bitches. Fourteen years later, the girls' ringleader, Anne Putnam, confessed. It was a great delusion of Satan that deceived me in that sad time where I justly fear I have the instrumental to bring upon myself and this land the guilt of innocent blood. In this country, scepticism about the witch hunts and the lack of concrete evidence involved grew towards the end of the 17th century. But the trial still went on. In 1694, at Bury St. Edmunds, a woman called Mother Munnings was accused a witch on this evidence. 
It was sworn that Thomas Pannell, her landlord, not knowing how to get her out of his house, took away the door and left her without one. Some time after, he, happening to pass by, she said to him, Go thy way, thy nose shall lie upward in the churchyard before Saturday next. On Monday following, her landlord sickened and died on Tuesday and was buried within the week, according to her word. But Mother Munnings was lucky. She was acquitted. People were more inclined to question evidence of this nature. The Reverend John Gore successfully exposed Matthew Hopkins' methods in the 1640s. But a bishop's word has more weight than a vicar's, so the publication which did the most to bury the witch hunt was possibly Bishop Francis Hutchinson's Essay Concerning Witchcraft, published in 1718. If the same notions were to prevail again, no man's life would be safe in his own house, for the fantastic doctrines that support the vulgar opinions of witchcraft rub us of all the defences that God and nature have placed for our security against the false accusers. The said Elizabeth Clark confessed she had carnal copulation with the devil six or seven years and he would appear to her three or four times a week at her bedside and go to bed with her and lie with her half a night together in the shape of a proper gentleman having the whole proportion of a man and the devil would say Bess, I must lie with you and she did never deny him For if any wicked person affirms or any cracked brain girl imagines that she sees any older woman pursuing her in her visions, they hang the accused parties for things they were doing when they were perhaps asleep upon their beds, or when they were perhaps in the accuser's own possession with double irons upon them. After Hutchinson, witch hunts were few and far between. There were isolated cases through the 18th century and even into the 19th century. You find occasional references to trials like this newspaper cutting from 1785. About the latter end of last month, a poor woman of Mears, Ashby, Northamptonshire, being suspected of witchcraft, voluntarily offered herself for trial. The vulgar notion is that a witch, being thrown into the water, will swim. But this poor woman, being thrown into a pond, sank instantly and was with difficulty saved. On which the cry was, No witch! No witch! There will always be certain people willing to scoff at anything that they do not consider usual. But it is now many a year since a witch, or a supposed witch, has died the death. The last of the Acts Against Witchcraft was repealed in 1951 and replaced by the Fraudulent Mediums Act. The old woman who went to the gallows then, where would you find her now? Probably in a rest home. For the harmless old lady who puts the cat out at night, the nightmare is over. Oh, my God.